All right, so Ephesus, learning to love. It's the first of uh, a series of talks. You've had the general introduction, which is great. And uh, this is a really important subject. It's so important, it's life and death. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us, without love, it's all vanity. I can be self-sacrificial to the point of death, and if I do not have love, young people, God values it as worthless. So it's really important, and we're going to see this ecclesia had a reputation, but it had no love. So to God, it was going to be taken away unless they changed. So where is Ephesus? Some of us, just a little quick history lesson. So Ephesus is on the western coastline. You can see there the Aegean Sea over here, uh, opposite um, the islands of Greece. It was one of the greatest seaports of the ancient world. It was actually one of the three greatest cities of the eastern Mediterranean at the time of Paul's writing. Therefore, it was actually a centre of trade. You can see here Ephesus of between Europe over this side and then obviously Asia this side. And the Ecclesia, therefore, was in a population of roughly about a third of a million people at that time and it operated with a very multiracial, multicultural society who was materialistic and worshipped the astrology, particular, particularly Diana of the Ephesians. And therefore, that led to various freedoms in their behaviour, being a port city, that everything went with that, including sexual immorality. So the letters themselves is a suggestion is that they're written and we're presented, would suggest the order of delivery. Obviously, we know John was on Patmos here and he comes into the first point, that's Ephesus, and that's the first of the Ecclesias. And then you can follow him through here as you follow the route round. So it seems that they come in that way. It's interesting that Ephesus where it was the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John actually spent some time at. And so it probably was the largest ecclesia and probably the most prominent ecclesia in the area. And therefore, it was a very key message that they were to rekindle their love. It's interesting, I belong to Enfield, one of the biggest ecclesias in Adelaide. Do, are we prominent? And is this a lesson for my ecclesia? And I had to think hard as I was preparing it. You can think to apply for yours as well. So that's the background. So let's have a little look then at the links that we have between chapter 1, the vision that uh, Uncle Ron did with you, and chapter 2. So if we look carefully, there's some differences between what we have of the vision in chapter 1 that starts in uh, verse 13, in the midst, one clothed like the Son of Man in chapter 1. You've got a visual representation there on the screen. And then we have certain elements that are picked out just for Ephesus in chapter 2. Okay, so this is the first little bit we can have a little look at in a moment of working together. So we see there, chapter 2, verse 1, unto the angel of the ecclesia of Ephesus right. So, I see the angel being the spiritual leader, or leaders of that ecclesia, who are given feedback on the behaviour of that ecclesia, and need, therefore, to do something about it. I don't think it applies to a literal angel, because they're the ministering, although they're, they're the ministering heirs to salvation. And then we see aspects that are selected, an extra little detail. Careful Bible reading will show that there's something in chapter 2, verse 1, that's not in chapter 1 and, and the vision. So here's the first thing then. So what can we see? Well, I'll help you first one. It's still got a right hand. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. Okay, if you look very carefully in that verse there, what can we find? Maybe I'll just give you a couple of minutes with your friend as well. So it's just in verse 2. There's two or three things in there that we don't find in the vision that starts in chapter 1 and verse 13 that goes down to verse 17. Just have a little look and then we'll just hopefully shout them out. Someone got one already? Luke's looking at me as if he knows one already. So it says that he's in the midst. Yeah. Fantastic. That's one. That's not the first one, so I'll look at it in a minute. Is that all right? <laughs> walking. So he's no longer just in the midst. He's walking. So he's active. Oh, let's take the point while it's there. He's active there. He's moving between the six lampstands. He's not static with just Ephesus. He's moving between the lampstands. Uh, the gospel radiates out of. And it would therefore tell the Ephesians that the judgment that God had given their ecclesia it's within the context of Jesus Christ knowing about all the other ecclesias because he's walking amongst them. He sees them in the context of the others. It's just not isolated to them. He knew firsthand observation of what brothers and sisters were saying in that ecclesia. 
He was reading their thoughts. He was the silent observer. He knew the motives behind those that were gathered and assembled at the Ephesus Ecclesia, as he did for all those other ecclesias that were represented there. He knew what was going on. And therefore, Jesus, in walking through the lampstands, his assessment couldn't be discredited in any way. You couldn't say, well, he doesn't really know what's going on. He did. He saw the Ephesus Ecclesia, the Ephesian Ecclesia, as it really was before God. And not what they were perceived by others. And I don't know about you, but that really hits home. And here's the first lesson. Because we don't want to just do study for study's sake, we want to apply it. God really knows what it's like for your ecclesia. Not necessarily what reputation the your ecclesia has in Adelaide, but he knows what it's really like. He knows what it's really like that you bring to that ecclesia, my dear brother and sister, or young people. He knows, and that can be a great comfort if you're trying to do what's right. But it can be also a great warning. If you're not really, your heart's not in it, and you're just going through the motions. Either way, Jesus will know. So thanks, Luke. Walking, okay? I'll put it up in a minute. <laughs> what else have we noticed while well, I was just saying that one? Anything else? In chapter 1, it just said he has the seven stars in yeah. his hand. In chapter 2, it says he holds them. Fantastic. Careful Bible reading. Okay, so he holds them really tight, doesn't he? So that's really... Another point that I want to... That word holdeth there, if you're making notes, means to have a firm grasp. Gospel of John, chapter 10, 29 says, No one shall snatch them out of my hand, talking about the sheep. And therefore, the Lord Jesus Christ has got a really cl a clenched fist, a really firm grasp of the Ephesian ecclesia. It's his ecclesia. And no one's going to take it away. The spiritual leadership is completely in the Lord Jesus Christ's power. It's under the almighty protection so the elders have emphasised the, their control is in the existence here. They have sorry, emphasised to them that Jesus is in control. It's he that holds the ecclesia together. Not the brothers and sisters, not the ABs, not anything else. It is him. It's what it's based on. Although it should be. And therefore, the ecclesia is determined by God and only made possible by the Lord Jesus Christ and nothing else. And if we're not careful, sometimes we can get that out of balance, can't we? See, it was important to them to understand that being zealous in upholding the truth, as we shall see, that they really wanted to upheld what was right before God, that they didn't go too far one way. Because they started then trusting in themselves and thinking that they were really important and forgetting that it was Jesus Christ's ecclesia, that he was there in the midst of them. And therefore, we should never let self-importance in our service, in our ecclesia, rise. Because it leads to pride. It leads to self-importance, and that brings spiritual death. And it's interesting, that little point there, that holdeth or graspeth, is also done for Sardis. And it's interesting that Sardis seems further down the line of decl decline. It could be well said that Sardis might have been what Ephesus would end up, dead, if they didn't do the things that we've seen, if Ephesus did not find its first love. So thank you. So we've had graspeth or holdeth, Walking, anything else we've noticed? Okay, look at the candlesticks or the lampstands. Any difference there? Who went, hmm? <laughs> oh, Luke. No, we're not. We're not, it's not going to be me and Luke tonight. So come on, someone else. What are we given in the second chapter two? But not in chapter one. What kind of lampstands are they? Thank you. They're golden. So it's not just a lampstand, as it should be. It's a golden lampstand. The Ecclesia's existence, as you know and I know, that gold represents faith. The Ecclesia is based on faith. And that's why it's there. The basis of that fellowship is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord God himself and everything that, went, that goes with that. All man-made documents, whether that is the Birmingham amended statement of faith, or other man-made documents that seem to try and express what we believe are subservient to what is the Bible, isn't it? The Bible is the key. That is the basis of fellowship. And all those other things try, seek to try and help us understand those things. Yeah? And you know, and I know, Psalm 119 verse 105 says, The Word of God is light. And so we have a lampstand here. So the Word of God is burning bright. It's a, through faith. Faith that cometh by hearing, through hearing by the Word of God. 
So here is the lampstand that they were to shine forth the gospel light. And you know, and I know, that the lampstand was a menorah, seven branch, to give light in the tabernacle of God. Isn't that interesting? Jesus Christ says, I'm walking amidst the lampstands. He is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek that is walking around the ecclesias. He is the one that's going to adorn, to trim the lamps, as it were, that was done in the Old Testament priesthood, and he's now doing it in the New Testament. By sending the letters to these ecclesias that they may trim their lamps, they may change their behaviour, that they may be better followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they may be better disciples, and for this ecclesia, that they may realise they need to learn to love. And the fact the ecclesias are portrayed as lampstands tells us two other things. For a lampstand, you need oil. Yeah, we all know that. Any other points? If you, want to make. you need oil. It's an olive oil that was provided by Israel, we're told, in the Old Testament. They had to provide, everybody in, the, in the Israel had to provide it. It wasn't just left to some tribe leaders, it wasn't just left to a certain tribe. Every tribe, every person had to contribute to the word of God in time. And that word of God wasn't just taking oil in its form, it had to be beaten. There was time and energy put in in the preparation of what you brought to the tabernacle to allow the lampstand to continue to burn. It never went out. And therefore, it's a constant line. And therefore, it's deliberate that we are told that these are lampstands because the members of those ecclesias, through faith, had to develop their faith, had to constantly provide faith through the word of God that they had to then shine the light of the gospel to those around in darkness, those in Asia Minor. And that brings a few questions back to us again, doesn't it? What's your oil contribution to your ecclesia? How do you individually contribute? Not take. Yes, I'm sure we all do that, but in contribute. Do you teach in Sunday school? Do you, are you an online Bible tutor? Do you give talks at your youth group? How much time and energy do you put into your ecclesia? Not just taking, not just visiting, but actually contributing. Doing something for the benefit of others, for the whole thing, that the light may shine. If you're baptised, I hope you're getting involved and finding the opportunities in your ecclesia. Because there will be. It might not be what you think, oh, that's what I want to be. I was younger once. and I remember I, I couldn't get involved, so I did Bible Mission Online course, correspondence course for the brother, some brethren in Nigeria. I did that for three years. And then in time, other things came out. And some of those time, opportunities were background stuff and other stuff. I was obviously standing on a platform. Whatever it is, contribute to your ecclesia. Take that with you. Put time and energy into your ecclesia. It can be visiting brothers and sisters in their home. It can be doing practical support. It can be praying for specific brothers and sisters that you know are in need at this time. Or for other young people that you know are struggling. I'm very aware of the pressures that are on young people of my job and I know it's harder than ever with a social media world and mental health and sexual immorality and all those things put together it is tough and therefore you need to be putting in in the word of God into your into your ecclesia that you may gain strength from your ecclesia that you may strengthen one another and not be just passive but active okay so we've looked at what the candlestick is we looked at what Jesus is doing specifically for it the Ephesian Ecclesia, and then he goes into verse 2, I know thy works. And that's why he knows, because he's been wandering around and he knows those things. But before we go into that, I just want to share with you, first of all, the structure that we have from now, from verse 2 to verse 7. And Jesus, I call it the feedback structure, okay? I don't know if you're at work, many of you are, you'll get feedback from your boss or your line manager or whatever, and, you know, give a session feedback, sometimes it's called appraisal if it's really a formal one. And things like that. Well, this feedback tr structure, I think, is fantastic. Okay, it's things that we can use in our daily lives. We can use in our ecclesial lives. We can because the Lord Jesus Christ used it, so it seems to be the perfect model. I've turned it to six C's. Okay, because every word starts with a C. So six C's. Okay, and uh, it's quite interesting. There's two ecclesias. You'd have to struggle to find six. There's only five because two ecclesias have no condemnation. Amazing, they don't have any condemnation. But the rest of them do. So six C's, and therefore it's a balanced, honest feedback. 
The feedback encourages, it admonishes, it shares with all that it's related, that it relates to. This letter was read to the Ephesian Ecclesia. It wasn't just to the ABs, it wasn't just to the Sunday school, it wasn't just to the youth group, it wasn't just to the older generation that are retired, it was to all of them. Okay, so the Ephesian structure of the letter is, and it follows this structure, and this is where we're going to have a bit of audience participation. So I'm going to practice in a minute. So I'm going to put one up there. The word that I want you to say is in colour, okay, the different colours because the different concepts as we follow through. And I'll just go like that, and that's your turn to say it. Does that make sense? Or otherwise we'll all be over the place. Okay, right, here we go then. First one. Oh, come on, we can do better than that. Wake up, try that again. Okay, of what is going well? Of what is missing? For change, with specific advice of how to change and why. Warning of what will happen if there's no change. Challenge. For the recipient to obey the feedback Completion. of change. If you change, then it brings the specific reward promised. So all those things, there's the feedback structure. We'll follow that three now as we look at the, um, as we look at the letter. Do you notice it starts with positive? Sometimes we're only keen when we give feedback. We go straight into the negative. Oh, you didn't do this, and by the way, that wasn't very good, and you could have... And we forget to say all the positive. Some of us are like that. And then some of us will go, oh, you know, you're doing such a great job and you don't know how to sort of say, well, actually, this bit isn't quite really what we wanted or isn't quite up to scratch because it's a bit awkward and difficult. Yeah? So some of us will go straight into the negative and some will go straight into the positive. Here it's balanced. Look at it. It's positive then it's negative. Then it helps you to know why and what you can do about it. And then there's sort of like a bit of an edge to it. If you don't do this, there's going to be something happen. Then you've got to say, well, they don't know what they're doing. Jesus didn't know what he was doing. He doesn't really know where. Or you say, actually, they do. I'm going to listen to it. I'm going to have humility to accept it because I want the reward. There's a bonus for doing that. There's, there's a, 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 a reward. And so that's a good model for us to use, isn't it? Yeah. If we're balanced and follow the Lord Jesus Christ, we might need to do that. And as I said, we sometimes fear one or the other. And I think... Young people, yours is probably the one to have the difficult conversation with. Because you want to be in the group. You don't want to fall out with your peers. You don't want them thinking something else. And, you know, oh, someone else can say that. Or, oh, yeah, I sort of know that's going on, but oh, it's not for me to say that it's not right. Because of your age, you find that more difficult. As you get older, you think, well, I don't mind so much. Though we still like to be liked. So if you follow Christ then you will have the moral courage. And that's what it is. It's moral courage. Courage to say what is right. What God says is right and what God says is wrong. And you will say that one to another. Because if you don't, then you're actually letting them continue on that path. Whatever it is. Yeah, it can be simple stuff. You know, It might be feedback on how to do something. Or it might be actually, you know, there's something wrong in their life. Or they're lying. Or worse, they're, they're deceiving. Or they're worse, they might get involved in a relationship they shouldn't be in. Or they're behaving in a way with drugs that they shouldn't be. Or sexually immoral that they shouldn't be. Whatever it is, you have to have the moral courage to stand up and tell them in love. In love. Not, oh, I'm telling you, and I'm more righteous than you. You want to restore the person. You want to help the person. And therefore we need to have moral courage in love to improve our obedience. All of us need that. Not to accept standards that, well, if that's what they want to do, this world promotes that. If that's what they want to do, let them do that. Every man doing that which is right in his own eyes, whether it's right for that ecclesia, it's right for that young person. No, is it right according to the word of God? And that's challenging, I know. Human nature says I'd like to sometimes not say something. But we need to say something. We need to help. We need to restore. Okay, so I'm going to show each of those words. I want to say it. We'll go through. Can we just do that again? It just helps you remember where you were up. So there's a six structure some of us got. So we're going to start with the first one. So here we go. Ready? Yay, good. Commendation. So here he goes. Commendation is, I know thy works, verse 2. I know thy works and thy labour and thy patience or endurance. Okay, so he goes, oh, I know exactly what's going on in your ecclesia. He selects certain aspects, their toil, their patient endurance, their resistance to false teaching, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they're apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. That word labour there, what we have there, 
I know thy works and thy labour means a weariness having given all, yet they'd not grown weary of toiling. So they're pretty exhausted in toiling here. I know that you just keep on going. You're not doing a, flat, a sprint and then you've stopped. This is a marathon. You, you keep on going. You keep on working here. The word patient endurance is used regarding things. There's an active perseverance here, a fortitude that does not deflect them from the truth nor affect their loyalty to their Lord to overcome whatever's thrown to them. They're there for their Lord. They're holding on zealously. They're not going to let things slip. They're not going to let false doctrine into the ecclesia. They're going to try that person. Are they right and true according to the word of God? And if they're not, then they've exposed them. They were hard working, enduring incorrect doctrine. And yet there was still a serious fault. What of us before we go into that fault? Is there a willingness to toil? Are you prepared to work? Work in the suburban environment, the suburban committee, work in your ecclesia, work in your home, your family home, do the chores or whatever it is. But as you get older, obviously part-time work, and then as you get older, university and work and various other things. But work in your ecclesia. It's back to that, isn't it? We live in an age that promotes a life of ease and comfort. An attitude of fortitude in an age of tolerance is really difficult. Oh, just tolerate that. But fortitude to keep on what's right and uphold that. Are we tempted to water down our beliefs or way of life to make it a little bit more palatable, a little bit more attractive, a little bit easier on myself? Or to harmonise with, with society's thinking? Society doesn't think that's too bad. Well, God didn't really quite mean that, did he? Yes, he did. Is there a perseverance in dealing with difficulties in our own home, our ecclesia, our youth group, our suburban? Or are we just tempted to throw the towel in and say, oh, it's all too hard, it's too difficult? Or do you hold to your position, your viewpoint, your stance? See, that's what this, the word of God does, isn't it? It challenges us young people, yeah? It has to come back to your heart and your life. I don't know what it is. But you don't know what mine is, really. And, they, and he says there, thou canst not bear them. Here we go halfway through to this. Thou canst not bear them which are evil. So there was a willingness to work, and they did not tolerate evil behaviour and distinguish those who were not true Apostles. The Ephesian brothers and sisters had a zeal for upholding the truth in purity. They did not tolerate evil teaching. That's fantastic. They're commended for it. A lesson for us that we might be tempted to tolerate evil as we do not want to make it difficult, as we said earlier. Or, you know, we, it makes us awkward. It might put them off the truth if we tell them as it really is. We might jeopardise our friendship with them. Or we make other excuses of why we don't really speak out or say something when we should. And it also says there, doesn't it, and has borne, verse 3, and has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has laboured and has not fainted. And that's where the idea of endurance. It was a faithful endurance in upholding the truth. You know, you, you see your older brothers and sisters in your ecclesia, don't you, who have endured. Some have done 50 years, 60 years of personal battle are becoming more like the Lord Jesus Christ. There are witnesses to us who are younger. And you are a witness to the younger ones, the ones that aren't yet at suburban. They look up. Everybody looks up to someone, the next generation usually, sometimes a little bit further. So it's a bit scary. You're looking up, but someone's looking up to you as well. What example are you showing? And did you notice it says there, thou hast borne, verse 3, and has patience for my name's sake? Reminds me of Matthew 7, doesn't it? Where Jesus says, Many will say in my day, Lord, Lord, I have prophesied, teaching in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And the response is, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. No, it's not. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Why does Jesus reject them? Why does Jesus here, having said these things, says, yet it's not good enough? It looks fantastic and there's a zealousness there and there's an eagerness and you want to uphold and it's not easy and you're working really hard, but yet it's not enough. Well, here we go for the next one. Ready? Oh, let's wake up a little bit. Okay. This is, here's the condemnation. It's a key theme, isn't it? Okay. Verse 4, nevertheless, 
So we've done the positive, but now we're moving into what Jesus knows they need. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. That's critical, isn't it? The word left there means abandoned, deserted, leave aside, cast aside their first love. Despite the faithful upholding of the truth, their earnest vigilance in imposing error, their endurance in dealing with false teachers, they had lost that all these things were a means to a greater end. Ephesus was the defensive ecclesia, but an emphasis on checking and monitoring the true doctrine was upheld. It was going to not have any false teaching here. And it says there, because thou hast left just thy love. No, it says thy first love. First means chief or foremost importance. You've left the thing that's most important, the chief. The RSV says, but I have this against you. You've abandoned the love you had at first when you were born as an ecclesia, when you came in as infancy as an ecclesia. They'd lost sight that it was God they served first, not others or themselves. And they should not have been self-confident in their positions of bastions of the truth, defending the argument in their own strength, their own intelligence. A technically correct heart ecclesia, making a stand for God's truth, had lost all its appreciation and thankfulness that they were yet still sinners, that they were needed to be thankful for what God had provided them, a means of salvation. It's interesting that Paul says to Timothy, if you take your notes, 1 Timothy 1 verse 5, the ESV says, the aim of our charge is love. That issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. I'll say that again. The aim of our charge is love. That issues from a pure heart and a good conscience <coughs> and a sincere faith. And this was given, wasn't it? That very phrase in 1 Timothy 1 5 was given in the context of false teachers. Just as they dealt with the false teachers in their ecclesia, yet they had lost their first love. What is that love? Well, we know it's agape love or agape love, however you want to say it. It's sacrificial love. It's not a natural love. It's a conscious love, as we shall see. It's a love that was to be their motive, their attitude behind the actions. This was critical, my dear young people. They've become technical believers, upholding Christ's teaching and keeping it pure. But in doing so, they'd lost their love for God and the Lord Jesus Christ they had when they were baptised when they were new in the truth, when they were a babe in Christ. And some of you here have been through that recently, some of you very recently. And I know that you would have had that joy, that amazement that you can be saved, that worthlessness, that realisation that you're a sinner, that you want a hope of salvation, that it's not about me, it's about God and all those things. And yet as you get older and time goes by, you can lose some of that. that they'd lost it, so we can lose it. And sometimes we can lose it very quickly. And therefore, we need to love the, the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. This is the first commandment. And the second commandment is to love thy neighbour as thyself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. So therefore, Jesus says, that's the summary of what it's all about. God first, others second, myself third. And the world says, no, 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 it's self first, others second, and God, well, if he exists down there somewhere. Flips it right round, doesn't it? So their serious fault was that they looked good, yet the, on the outside, yet inward, they, they were dying. You see, this is really tough and it's really hard. We can be doing the right thing with the wrong motive. You can be, you know, I can be doing this, and if I've got the wrong motive, it's worthless. You might get something out of it, but it's worthless in my service to God if I do this out of anything but love. And you can do the right thing with the right motive and it's of great value to God. So what is the motive behind your service? What are the, some of the things that you could be doing? What, what are the, some of the reasons that we can just be going through the motions, going to suburban, going to our young people group of our ecclesia, going to our ecclesia and all those things and it's not actually love. Well, I don't know what you're thinking of but I try to think of some. I'm doing it out of duty. This is what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, duty. I'm expected to. 
Maybe the weight of expectation from family members. This is what they want me to do, so I'll do it. Yeah? Or it might be tradition. Well, I'll, this is what we do. This is what my family's always done. I wouldn't know what to do on a Sunday morning. That's where we go. Or it might be family pressure. It might be ecclesial constitutions. It might be a whole range of man thinking. And not love. Or we can obviously have a heart that desires to love God. And we say, we just want to love God and love our, everyone else. And yet it doesn't matter really what they think and believe. We'll embrace. Or... And that's not right either. We have to uphold right doctrine. Yeah. We break bread as brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ that have a common basis of fellowship. It's not an open table that anybody can break bread and drink wine. That just believes in God and loves Jesus. I've opened my heart to him. Therefore, it's a balance. Yes, there's love has to be the motive, but a love of the things of God. And as we shall see, love of what God wants. They had to do these things. It has to be balanced. They would started as an ecclesia. In one, Ephesians 1 verse 15, you'll hear, it says these words. Paul thanks God for them. When they were firstly formed, he says these words. After I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and the love to, unto all the saints... I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my old prayers. So way back, they had love. Paul says that. <laughs> and love unto all the saints. So what went wrong? I'm sure there was no conscious decision. Right, we'll abandon love now, that's too hard. Or an ecclesial resolution passed by the ecclesia to stop loving. And therefore, it must have gradually disappeared. It was there at the start, but when it comes here, it is not there anymore, my dear young people. Therefore, it must have come as a tremendous shock when the elders opened that letter and they read it out and they're like, oh, it's really good, we're doing this well, we're doing that well, and we're doing that, yep, we're upholding the truth, and then suddenly, nevertheless, I'm somewhat against thee because you've left your first love. What? How would you feel if that was said of you? Hang on, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, doing, doing, doing. Oh, that's back to the Pharisees, isn't it? I do this, I do that, I tithe, I pay. To... But the publican said, God be merciful to me, a sinner who appreciated the love of God. Therefore, it must have come a tremendous shock, and they needed to learn to love, both in their individual lives and communal lives, and not by the rules or human expectations to control what went on their ecclesia, but love was to permeate. You see, the intention was correct, but the method was not. I'm sure in that ecclesia they wanted to do what was right, but they'd lost the, in the essence of preserving truth, the purity of the truth, left, left, it, it caused a sort of untrusting atmosphere. An atmosphere that tragically, in preserving, upholding truth, they'd lost the supreme quality of love. What's the motive and the operation of you in your ecclesia? What reputation does Enfield, does, I don't know, start looking around Brighton and Burnside and where else we got a few, up Mount Barker, so I'm not going to list them all, One Tree Hill, yeah, Southern Vales, just make sure we're balanced, sorry, yeah. But what kind of reputation does it have? Are you a loving ecclesia or are you a hard ecclesia? Are you one for upholding the truth or are you, well, they're a bit loose to let most things go? Whatever it is, we need to be balanced. If we're going to do that, then we've got to do these things. Because the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't leave them hanging and say, well, you haven't got that right, so you need to do something about it. He tells them how to do it. So here it is. We're going to say our word again. So here we're on to the next one. Ready? Command. Command. All right. So this is not optional. It's not an optional lecture. Take it if you like it. But, you know, if you don't want to, it's a bit too hard. No, you need to do this. It's a command. So he says, verse 5, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. All right, so remember, you've got to think back to where you were when you did love as an ecclesia and repent. Repent. That's what they've got to do. Remember where you've fallen from. They needed to rid themselves of pride. And I think that's a bit of an appeal to the older generation here. Because some 40 years earlier, we know from Paul, he, he commended them for love. And therefore, he's probably appealing to them to say, look, speak up. Recall how the ecclesia used to operate in love. Rekindle that back. Show the example. And then the younger generation, like yourself, were looking for guidance, were wanting to know what that looked like. What does love look like in my ecclesia? 
And they would show that and demonstrate. So you'd have the two together, each generation helping the other. The young, the enthusiasm of yourselves, the flexibility, energy with those that are older and hopefully would remember what it was to love and demonstrate that. So are you doing your part in your ecclesia and am I doing mine? Keep remembering the reality of your position. You are a sinner in need of salvation. You might have this role, that role, done this, done that, be from this family, that ecclesia. Before God, you're a sinner that needs salvation. That is a son and daughter of God if you come through the waters of baptism that needs to grow to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ, that needs to demonstrate love, to have love behind the motive of development. We're to change our attitude and our motive. Repent, as the word means, a change of mind and attitude, a change of heart, a direction. They let it slip, so you've got to get it back. It wasn't too late, they could do it. But if they did, didn't do anything about it, it would be too late. It's just more than sorry. Oh, I didn't mean to, I'm sorry, oh, I won't do it again. They had to radically shake up their ways. An urgent shake up. And then the last point was there, and do the first works first works. What's that? They need to get back to how they behaved when the Ecclesia first said the gospel. Get back to basics. Get back to the requirements of the truth. Get back to what the word of God says. Not all the other organisational layers that maybe have come in to protect the truth, to guard the truth and in themselves have taken them away from the love of the truth. Maybe it become too institutionalised, too technical, too letter of the law taking precedent over the spirit of the law. The importance being on what was done rather than why it was done. Do you are a like that? Well, it's really important what's done and not why. Was it actually why we're doing that? Because that goes to the motive, doesn't it? They need to do what we have in Acts 2.42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Yes. And fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers, the four sides of the spiritual encampment. Therefore, they spent time with each other. You don't do those things if you're not with each other. And they believed all things in common. But it wasn't just doctrine, was it? It was fellowship, breaking of bread and in prayers. They were spending time in helping one another, supporting one another, so that they had, we're told, gladness and singleness of heart. There was joy there. There was happiness. There was general, genuine thankfulness and appreciation of what God had done for them in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's the same what they had to do here. Command for change was to do all those things. And then we get a little extra detail, which is kind of interesting. I'm going to put it in here. If we just jump, we'll come back to the, cha the challenge or the warning. But let's go to verse 6. And the, I think the Lord Jesus Christ puts this in. He does it in two letters. Maybe in case they sort of get disheartened and just... He says, but this thou hast, you know... He's, and he's saying that after, he says, look, if you don't do anything, I'm going to remove the lampstand. The ecclesia will cease to exist. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So there's an extra little bit of commendation here. You don't get it, only get it here in one other letter. Where the Lord Jesus Christ, as it were, I think, realises maybe that's just going to crush them. Maybe they're going to just take this too hard. Maybe they're going to just give up. Maybe they'll let it all slip. The other one being doctrine with Pergamos in verse 15. He doesn't wish them to draw the wrong conclusion, does he? He says, you're right to hate the works of the Nicolaitans. Love must not reduce hatred of error or hatred of immoral behaviour. Say that again. Love does not give them licence or the reason not to hate that of error or immoral behaviour. You see, the Nicolaitans believed in the immortality of the soul and with the consequence, therefore, of no judgment, we've got an immortal soul, then whatever I do is fine because it, I'll continue in the next life. And therefore, it permitted immorality. You can do whatever you like, there's no accountability. It's like the world out there, isn't it? And notice he says, I hate the works. Not He doesn't say, I hate the Nicolaitans. I hate the works of the Nicolaitans. You see, he hated what was done not the people themselves. We hate people that are in immoral relationships. Not the people, but what they're doing. Because yeah. God is, this indicates that. We hate the actions, not the person, such as in Jude. Let's just go to Jude 23, just to flick back to Jude for a minute, which emphasises that. 
It says, and others saved with fear, pulling him out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. You hate the garment, not, not the body, as it were. So you hate that. Okay, so we need to then do what we've come to live in about. And that's learning to love God's way. So those people who haven't got a hand out, if you raise your hands now, and those people who have got spares, we'll give it to you. So if we just put up our hands... For those of you who've got one, and when you get one, one slight error. So if you go to the third bullet point under number one, it says God's love demonstrated in us. Can you put one, John 4 verse 16? The little one got, got uh, moved. So that's so there's four aspects, four stages. It starts at the top and works down. And the third bullet point of that number one, God's love demonstrated in us should be one, John 4 verse 16, not John 4 verse 16. If you want to just make a note of that, hopefully it's small enough for you to slot in. And you can put it in any of these references that we're going to go to now as we just learn what is God's way to love and that the ecclesia at Ephesus needed to do. Okay, so we've all got one now? Yep, good. So I've got it on the screen there. So let's have a look at this. Hopefully it won't take too long. I'm just conscious of time we want to get to the end as well. So the first point we want to do there is say is that it starts with God. Love isn't something else. It starts with God. You're finding love and it's demonstrating that to us. So let's go. We're just going to quickly go through these references and then if something strikes with you or resonates with you, you can then just put this with that at the end. Okay. So let's just turn back to 1 John chapter 4, please. Verse 8. We're going to go quite quickly, but hopefully you can just follow it through. If you want to make a note of anything, you can put it on the sheet, obviously. So 1 John 4, verse 8 says, He that loveth not, not knoweth not God. For God is love. There you go. There's the origin. He's the source of it. Verse 16 as well. We see there, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. All right? So very clearly, he's the source. He's the origin of love. And it's that that initiated God to send his son to deliver us. So let's look at verse 9 of 1 John 4. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. So he sends his son. God was the prime mover behind salvation. He was the one that started it. The attribute of love caused him by his own free will to reflect Mankind needed saving, so he sent his son. And we see that also in verse 10. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation or a covering or a mercy seat for our sins. So he didn't just send his son, but he sent his son to cover our sins, to bring us back to have a restored relationship with God, to have that enmity overcome. And therefore... Learning to love God's way is all about acknowledging that God's motive of love initiated our salvation and that we needed saving. That was the first works. That's what the Ephesian brethren and sisters had to get back to. And we can see it's demonstrated in us. 1 John 4, the third point, verse 16. And we have known and believed that the love of God hath to us. God is love and that he dwelleth in love, dwelleth in God and God in him. That the love of God that hath to us. If you're baptised, you have experienced the love of God. You've accepted that through shown through his Son and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ in providing that sinless way of life that we may be a mercy seat, a, a way of salvation opened up unto us. And that leads us into number two. That act of baptism is responding, isn't it, in love to God's love and to show it to others. That's not forced on us. Love isn't forced on us in that sense. It's our own free will that we choose to do this. Let's look at verse 9 and 10. We see it there. And this was manifested the love of God toward us. This is 1 John 4. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. There is no other means of salvation. There is no other name. And therefore, it's him. We here put we choose by our own free will. To love God and his son. He does not force us to love him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting love. That is offer is to everyone but not everyone responds. 
And we love God by keeping his commandments. It's probably the first thing that might make us go, hmm? 1 John 5, verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God, what do we do? We keep his commandments. Verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. His commandments are not grievous. God's commandments are not natural. There's no natural feeling about this. God's commandments are unnatural. But if we have the love of God in us, as we come to read the word of God and come to know of his commandments and what he expects of us, there comes a point when we respond to that love. We've seen that. And we desire to love God is by keeping his commandments. We demonstrate our love to him. We are obedient to it as we're coming up to it. And we widen that out. To others, we widen, the third point there, we widen it by loving one another. 1 John 4, 11. Behold, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. See, the Lord Jesus Christ died on that stake for me as he did for you. And that was because the Lord God himself caused his only begotten son to come into existence and to lead that sinless life. And the Lord Jesus Christ in love leading that life offered that salvation. And therefore, who am I to say, well, I shouldn't love them and them. If God has loved everyone and wants us to respond, everyone to respond, then we have to love those also. We ought to love one another, those that have responded of the household of faith. And in love for mankind, we go out and show them what God's love has provided if they only respond. And then we come to the third stage. You've seen that God's love is a conscious decision, seen in obedience. Love, God's love causes us to give up our own will. We don't do what we want because we want to please God. We want to do what he wants. Keep your marker in there or a bookmark or whatever. And we're just going to go over to John, John 15. This is powerful words, you probably know. It's from the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing if a feeling. It's no sort of Hollywood thing that you get promoted in the world about love. The love of God... The Ecclesia of Ephesus had to develop this love, agape love. So John 15, verse 13 says, in the context of verse 12, this, ye love one another as I have loved you. And we sang that deliberately at the start. What's that love? Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. Jesus Christ laid down his life. He voluntarily gave it up. He made a conscious decision to do what God wanted. He didn't just, he wasn't um, paralysed by the situation. He could have called 12 legions of angels if he wanted to. He was totally in control, a lot of it, by what he said and what he didn't say to certain people. And then in the end actually said something that caused them to go, oh, he's spoken blasphemy and therefore then charged him. So God was, Jesus, sorry, was totally in control. So love causes us to give up our own will, the Lord Jesus Christ ultimately giving that up. Let's go back. So love is an action. 1 John 3. So hopefully you've got your marker. We'll flick back there. 1 John 3. Hopefully you've got it on the screen there as well. Yep. 17 and 18. The end of that verse 17 says, How dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue. So let's not just talk about it. Oh, yeah, we should be more loving. Yes, we should love one another more. Yes, I should love my brothers and sisters. Yes, I should show love. It says, but in deed and in truth. In action, NIV says, but in deed and in action. It's interesting. I've observed it and I've heard others say it. Sometimes the most loving ecclesias don't talk about it. Sometimes the most unloving ecclesias talk all a lot about it, but don't actually do much about it because all the energy has gone in talking about it. Yeah. So busy saying what we should be doing rather than getting on doing it. And therefore it's an unnatural obedience. Let's go back to chapter 4, 1 John 4, verse 12. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us. Without the love of God, God does not dwell in us. The word of God dwells in our hearts. And that motive of loving God then dwells in us. God is able to grow in us. We are able to reflect God as seen in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's amazing, isn't it? And that's not natural. It comes through the process of the word and through our motive of wanting to please him. And then God's love matures, bringing in a future assurance and reward. 
It's a maturity that grows. And you can see this in older brothers and sisters. I've seen this in my grandparents before they fell asleep. There was no chance of the kingdom. There was no like, oh, well, God might remember me. It was a quiet, confident assurance. They'd gone to the end. They'd lived a life of faithful obedience. They've loved their God. And the next waking moment, they would be with their Lord. And they had total confidence in the love of God that they would be saved. Not arrogance. Look at it. First in 18. There is no fear. There's no dread. There's no fright of the judgment if you love. If you love God in love. But perfect or mature or complete love casts it out fear or dread. That fear of rejection. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So do you fear meeting the Lord Jesus Christ? My dear brother, my dear sister, do I? When the angel appears, the first thing they say always is fear not, because the human reaction, if the one appeared now, is oh, my heart would be beating to, you know, right out here. And I'd be fearful, naturally. And then after that, finally, at last, I'm going to see my Lord, who I've modelled my life on, who I've tried to emulate to please my God in love. And that maturity banishes fear of rejection. It gives us access to that re it's eternal reward. Just flick back to Jude again. Just going through the last point there, Jude 1, 21. It's lovely. It just has it little, just phrases it beautifully for us there in Jude. It says, oh, losing all my markers. It says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So there it is. A little process. And hopefully one of those you might think, yeah, I need to work on that. Well, that's going to be helpful to me. And then you slip it in by there, please. I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. And I've just put it again here. And I just emphasise some words that you might want to ring. Because it's about action, isn't it? It's about defining, demonstrating, responding, showing, decision, obedience, matures, assurance. There's nothing passive about it. Okay, let's go on. Time is running on, so let's go on. Next one is, your turn to say something. Okay, so what's the consequences for no change? Well, let's go back to Revelation 2, if you're not there already. Revelation 2, we left it halfway through verse 5. They are to repent, remember, they were to do the first works, they... Or he says halfway through, Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Ecclesial membership would suddenly drop. The ecclesia would not be persecuted or remain few in number, as some might have. This prominent ecclesia would cease to exist. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, I, I will remove it. It's not, it's not yours, it's mine. And I will remove it if you do not do these things. They're very powerful words, young people, they're very powerful consequences if they didn't take that action. It was a challenge. Notice it says, just a little point, I will remove thy candlestick. Not my candlestick as it should have been, but thy candlestick. It become a man-made thing, an organisation, another church, dare I say. Because it wasn't having the love of God. Yes, it was right on the right doctrines, but it wasn't right before God. Thy candlestick. It become a man's thing rather than a God's thing. Jesus wasn't at the centre of it. And so therefore, they, the great paradox for them, the truth that they feared to lose, that they protected, that they upheld, would be taken away because they did not have love. It's ironic, isn't it? Therefore, an urgent change had to occur. And if they did that urgent change, then, here you go, ready? Nearly at the end. Challenge. So there was a challenge now. They hear these things. Verse 7, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the ecclesias. Here's the challenge. If you're going to listen to the feedback, here it is. I've given it to you. Now what are you going to do about that feedback? It's the same phrase that's used with the seven ecclesias. You know that, no doubt. And it's a need for those elders to respond. We know in Matthew, the Lord Jesus Christ says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, like the man built upon the rock or house upon the rock. So what does he say? To overcome. To him that overcometh. Final word? Sorry. Overcometh? You've done challenge, sorry. My fault. They had to heed the warning. Yeah? They had a choice. Do I do it? Do I not? Do I take any action? Don't know. 
Take personal responsibility. Well, it's all right for brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. Oh, yeah, that family, they need that. No, 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 it applies to me. To obey the instruction given. And they were to trust in Christ's analysis. You know, Christ didn't get it wrong. You can see into our hearts and minds. He wasn't going to get it wrong. And therefore, the theme of suburban this year is it? To him that overcometh. And there it is. To him that overcometh. Because you're going through the letters. If you overcome, if you accept the challenge, if you do those things, then you will have, and it's something is emphasised for every ecclesia. And what's emphasised is something that's going to help that ecclesia with the issue that it had. We're going to see that now with Ephesus. For them, everyone, completion. And that brings reward of access. Remember, it was the guarding ecclesia. It was guarding the truth. Well, it's going to give them access to something that God has guarded. He's guarded that tree of life way back from the Garden of Eden. And here he says, To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise or the garden of God, as we know what that word paradise means. So the very thing that they cherished, the very thing that they loved or were to love, the truth, God had preserved access to eternal life through all the ages, would be granted to them. <coughs> they would be allowed to enjoy paradise, as that word means there. God or the garden, the holy land, the inheritance that is told them in Isaiah 51 verse 3. Jesus Christ, the second Adam, the bridegroom would come and take them. As we know, this is a letter of love, to love as all of them are, that he would take them as his bridegroom. And it's interesting that this promise, like all the promises, and you'll see it as you go through the study, finds its fulfillment at the end of the book. So let's just turn to Revelation 22. <clears throat> and here it is, the tree of life, right at the end, and you find the links between the two. Verse 2, and here it is, and in the midst of the street of it, after the throne of God, on either side of the river there was the tree of life, which bared twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And it's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah? They were promised access to that. And that there it is. It would be there for the healing of the nations, upholding truth, because they've done it in love. And so we wait in faithfulness for that kingdom of God and that promise for ourselves to that access to the kingdom of God. So let's just summarise then. There's a few things to take away, hopefully. So warnings for us. What do we get from the letter to the Ephesians? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ sees us as we really are. You might deceive your parents, you might deceive other young people, you might sometimes, and we do, deceive ourselves. Yet we cannot deceive the Lord Jesus Christ. He can see you right into your heart. He knows what you're thinking now. He knows where your life is it's now in relation to what he commands. Love has to be the motive for our actions. Nothing else counts. It has to be love. So tomorrow, if you're serving in your ecclesia, is it love that motivates that or is it all those other things. Jesus knows how well we are learning to love. It's a process. It's, we're not going to you know, wake up and go, oh, I've got it cracked. It's a process that we have to work on. It's a lifetime thing. But over a period of a lifetime, you can get to those final stages. And ultimately, by the grace of God, we'll all be there. Yeah? And therefore, there's great encouragement as well. The Lord knows if you're putting labour for him with all our energy, with all our effort. He knows if you're working really hard on the suburban committee. He knows if you're working really hard in your Sunday school or in your youth group in your place. He knows if you're really doing the readings and praying regularly. He knows whatever you're doing or what you're not doing and your attitude. He knows if you endure following him under personal pressure. I do not know what you've come tonight with, with what burden you are burdened with. We've got everybody's got something. It might be the burden of others. It might be the burden of your family. It might be the burden of your own mental health. It might be the burden of a relationship. It might be burden of work. It might be burden of a, an issue in your ecclesia. He knows. That we, and which you endure, and he knows that. Would I have moral courage? And this is the last one I leave you with, but this is probably the most critical one. Because the strength of these suburban young people will be because of that. It won't be because of committee. It won't be because of elders. It'll be the strength of yourselves, giving good feedback, moral courage one to another. Yes, you'll be helped by those other factors, but it's the strength of the collective body, and you are the collective body. You need to help one another. You need to have the moral courage to stand up when things are not right, 
to say something to the right people in the right way, get the right person to help if that's required. That you may have that moral courage, that you may be balanced in your feedback and have the courage to receive that if it's given to you. I don't know if you've ever had that when someone's done that to you. Natural reaction is to flare up, pride. But if they're doing it in love, then you go, well, thank you. We all have a blind side that we don't see. And when someone reveals that, then you can do something about it. And if it's done in love, they're going to help you to grow to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening and for your contributions. Thank you.